Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fiscal Fridays with National Taxpayers Union. I'm Maddie Duffler, the Senior Fellow for Fiscal Policy at NTU, and I'll be joined today by two of my esteemed colleagues to talk about state policy. Of course, we've been talking a lot about what's to come with the election just a few weeks away, uh, but what doesn't receive a lot of attention all the time are different ballot initiatives that taxpayers will be weighing in on across the country. We're going to give you a look on some of those most onerous provisions today with our NTU ballot guide and be previewing the release of that document next week that will run through all of the ballot initiatives that taxpayers are facing across the 50 states on November 3rd. Uh, before we get started, as always, we have question and answer, so please feel free to throw a question into the question box if you have any questions as we continue throughout this discussion. But without further ado, let me introduce my esteemed colleagues today. I'll be joined by Leah Bookmere, who's the VP of State Affairs here at National Taxpayers Union. Uh, if you've been watching these webinars at all, you know that I'm a proud Wisconsinite, as is Leah. She's based in Wisconsin, but of course travels uh, throughout the country to advocate for taxpayers on behalf of NTU. She comes to us after running for United States Senate in Wisconsin and serving in the state uh, house as well. We will also be joined by Tommy Ayello. Tommy is our state affairs manager here at, at NTU, and he is also the author of the ballot guide. So he's the one who has poured his blood, sweat, and tears into researching all of the different ballot initiatives that will be impacting taxpayers this November. And so we are so lucky to have both of them joining us here today. I'm going to kick it off uh, right away with turning it over to Leah. Leah, since you are based in Wisconsin, uh, you and I both know that Illinois, our neighbor to the south there, is usually used as a bad example for taxpayer policy. Uh, but that's especially true with the upcoming election. Can you talk a little bit about what's on the ballot in Illinois uh, and what they're trying to do to issue a, co a constitutional referendum to change how taxpayers are taxed uh, in Illinois? Well, they want to get rid of their flat tax and go to a graduated income tax. And the, the new range would be 4.75% to 7.99%. And so if you ask me, what does that mean for the folks in Illinois, I believe it means a mass exodus. You know, Maddie, you and I are used to flatlanders from Illinois coming up to vacation in Wisconsin, but now I believe they will be coming up, packing their bags and moving to Wisconsin, as well as opening businesses in Wisconsin. And we've seen this trend over the course of the last 10 years, the number of people that have left, Wisconsin, uh, left Illinois and come to Wisconsin. When you look at the neighboring states as well, Michigan has a flat tax 4.5%. Indiana has a, another flat tax 3.23%. This is going to be devastating for people and will lead to so many fleeing the land of Lincoln and going elsewhere. So I think this is a really bad time for Illinois to be doing this. The governor has thrown out a, a way to entice people to support this by suggesting or, or proposing that he will um, offer property tax release. Well, you know that that bait and switch often doesn't work. And uh, I think this is a bad move for the folks in Illinois. And hopefully they will wake up on November 3rd and vote against this measure. And so for Leah, for those folks who are not uh, very aware of how Illinois' income tax works, why do they need a constitutional amendment to make this change? Um, it's, it's the way that it is in, their, in their, um, their constitution, and what they've already done is they have passed statutory new uh, rates, um, and in order to put those statutes into action, they have to change the constitution. And so that's what makes it different. Um, so they've already proposed the new rates that's passed, signed into law, but now the constitution has to change to uh, meet with the statutes. And Leah, you mentioned how taxpayers tend to vote with their feet, especially in the Midwest, where a hop, skip, and a jump across the border can mean a big difference in your tax liability. I believe Illinois has lost eight, over 850,000 taxpayers over the last 10 years, according to IRS data. So that's certainly a trend that will continue if this tax hike is able to go into effect. Uh, Tommy, it's also, over to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Leah. Oh, no, I was going to say, it, it's also going to affect the businesses as well. So the corporate um, tax rate um, is going to go up 10.49% uh, and the small businesses will pay 9.49%. So wow. and this is going to be very devastating in general at a time when the state is already having budget deficits and you know they have an unfunded pension liability. Um, they have maxed out their credit card and uh, you add this to it with people leaving, this is going to be very devastating for the state. 
Yeah, Leah, I'm so glad you brought up that state corporate tax rate because we talk a lot about it at the federal level, of course, with the presidential election coming up and you've got Vice President Biden pledging to remove the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and bringing that corporate tax rate back up. The thing that folks often forget is that the United States is unique in that we have state corporate taxes as well. So when companies in the United States are paying that federal income tax, they also have to layer a state corporate income tax on top of it, which typically raises uh, their effective tax rate. So that's something when business are competing worldwide that they really have to take into account. So when you hear Vice President Joe Biden talk about uh, increasing the corporate tax rate to 28%, that's typically not the rate that most small businesses like a small business in Illinois would be paying. Um, On to the next state that normally serves as a bad example, which of course is California. No shortage of terrible tax policy coming out of that state. But Tommy, I want to pull uh, you into this conversation to ask you about uh, property taxes there, which are certainly on the ballot for California taxpayers. What are they facing and what will be the effect this November? Sure. So the biggest tax increase on the ballot this year out of any state, and this will come a shock to a lot of your viewers, is that the biggest tax increase has happened to be in California. Proposition 15, it's a $12.5 billion a year tax increase, and actually would be the biggest tax increase in state history. So right now under current law, tax rates on residential and commercial properties are based on the purchase price, and those property tax increases are capped at 2% annually. So if a home or business's property value rises quickly, property owners don't have to worry about a big tax increase that they can't afford. Unfortunately, Prop 15 tosses these protections right out the window. Proposition 15 allows commercial properties worth more than $3 million to be reassessed every year and at least once every three years. So if a commercial property value rises rapidly, tax tax bills will as well. Meanwhile, it would be an administrative chaos for property tax collectors across every locality. They'd be forced to hire an army of tax assessors since every businesses, every business could see a tax increase every year. Uh, supporters of the tax measure say it really won't impact small businesses, only commercial landlords. But like every other tax, we see a cascading effect here. Higher taxes on landlords will be passed along to small businesses in the form of higher rental agreements, and those small businesses will increase prices on their goods to cover higher rental costs. And again, this probably shouldn't be surprising for any of our viewers who've been following our work in the great state of California. Uh, Tommy, since you are the author of the ballot guide, in California, we're not just looking at state tax increases, we're looking at local tax increases Mm -hmm. as well. This in particular would be a property tax increase across the state of California, correct? Right, for a commercial business is correct. And so you also mentioned to me uh, when I asked you what the worst measures were that were on the ballot in the country, you just said everything in San Francisco, everything in San Francisco is bad. Would that layer on top of these taxes that Californians are facing on the ballot? Absolutely. So San Francisco is another area where taxpayers and businesses could get the short end of the stick. Just in San Francisco alone, there's three measures that could increase taxes by $433 million a year. Mm -hmm. The first measure adjusts the gross receipts tax rate in, in the city. And uh, the second one is a new real estate transfer tax. So every time you sell a house, you're not to pay a tax. And a new gross receipts tax that depends on the ratio between executive and employee compensation. So the higher the disparity between what your top executives make and your median employee, they'll be paying a higher gross receipts tax. Wow. And as we know, gross receipts tax, of course, in a troubled economic times, such as what we're currently experiencing, businesses are still exposed to that tax, regardless of whether or not they're making a profit. So they're particularly harmful in these kinds of situations. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Well, we've covered Illinois. We've covered California. Uh, you might think we'd be, we'd be going next to Connecticut or some of the other usual players in the bad tax policy. But actually, there's another tax hike on the ballot on energy in Alaska. Leah, I know you've been following this initiative closely. Can you talk a little bit about what that initiative is and what effect it would have in taxpayers there? Yes, uh, it's going to be uh, very devastating for the state of Alaska, the frontier state, which we know as being one of the the great states for oil production. It it is a tax that would target the North Slope fields. And you've heard of uh, Prudhoe Bay, Kuparik, and Alpine fields. These are fields that produce 80% of the oil uh, production in Alaska. And 80% is a key number because not only does that part of the state produce 80%, in general, Alaskans rely on this resource. The taxes bring in approximately 80% of the state's revenue. So think about that for a moment. 
and what that would mean if we target this very um, important part of the state. You know, this is the eighth change in tax policy in 15 years in Alaska. So this is adding and creating to, uh, an unstable and unpredictable um, tax climate. You know, in the same 15 year span, we've seen a 50% decline in the production of oil in Alaska. So you have to wonder how much of an effect that this tax climate is having on the state. If you're an investor, why would you want to come to Alaska if you're not sure what's going to happen with the tax climate? They're already, as an investor, dealing with a harsher climate in the North Slope area, a more litigious area because of uh, the high risk nature of this type of industry and just geographical distance uh, from markets. So these are issues that already make it difficult for the North Slope and uh, for investors wanting to uh, produce in the North Slope. And now you add another layer of um, tax uncertainty. This is going to be bad for Alaska. You know, Alaska is um, already showing signs of decline internationally and domestically in its oil production. So this would be bad. The pandemic has affected tourism in the state. And if you add this another layer um, to the uh, economy, it's going to be uh, very problematic for individuals, residents, small businesses, all the supporting parts of this industry. And so you raise a good point that I think reflects a theme of this conversation today, which is that the tax base that a lot of these states rely on is the one that is seeking or is receiving the most scrutiny in some of these ballot measures. In Illinois, it's the high income earners that will be driven out of the state. In California, it's the business owners that's going to be, that tax base is going to be eroded. Energy space in Alaska, of course, is crucial. Leah, in your work in the states, what would you anticipate would be the outcome of these types of ballot initiatives that really get at the heart of the economy of some of these states? Do you think that taxpayers are going to reject these tax hikes out of hand? Do you think that the wording on the ballot initiatives can sometimes be confusing for taxpayers, so it's a harder battle to educate on these measures? How do you see a lot of these things playing out? Well, I know that in Alaska, it's receiving so much attention. I've spoken to former colleagues of mine uh, from the state legislature there, and they said it is just filling up the airwaves. Um, so hopefully the word is getting out there. Illinois is another story. This is sort of their, <laughs> their trend, and um, I'm, I'm not so optimistic. The wording is, is really key, and uh, a lot of times these uh, initiatives, um, as we have followed them, we see that they, are, they follow after a failed legislative approach. So in many states, it's very easy to get something like uh, these questions on the ballot, and then they're worded in such an ambiguous way that the average voter isn't sure what to do or they say, oh, that's not so bad, I'll vote yes. And, and so I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we have this ballot guide and we get that, this information out. Uh, we've been doing a great job. Tommy's done an awesome job. We're trying to get it to media outlets. We will get it to media outlets in, in time for voters to make their final decisions. And on that point, let's turn to the author of the ballot guide himself again, Tommy. You know, we've covered California, Illinois, Alaska. What are some of the other things out there that you're watching thinking, wow, this could be really harmful for taxpayers if they make their, make their way through these ballots? Yeah, I think for us, the most concerning aspects are the local measures. We found over 2,000 local ballot measures that are going to be across hundreds of counties. And a lot of the times, they don't say exactly what they're doing. Um, the ballot tax will just say it'll increase the sales tax rate by half a penny. And it might not sound like a lot, you know, that's half a penny on, on a, you know, a $1 purchase. But it's really when you start adding them all up and, you know, seeing the total effect, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, and in some cases, tens of millions of dollars, depending on the size of the locality. So localities and states, they need to be more straightforward with their taxpayers on how much they're going to be raising taxes. I mean, I've called hundreds of county offices. I know Leah and uh, Jess, another one of our colleagues, have, a colleague has called these different um, counties to see the total tax um, revenue estimation. And a lot of times they don't even know. So if they don't know, how should taxpayers are gonna be kept in the dark when they fill in their ballots as well? 
So the people who are responsible for the administration of these taxes don't even know how much revenue they're going to raise. Correct. Yeah, they and don't know or they don't want to share that information, but they make it very, very difficult. And you know, we have uh, reached out to many county uh, offices and um, imagine, you know, a constituent uh, can't get that information. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's very troubling and we need that transparency. Transparency is so incredibly important and that's why I'm glad that we have this ballot guide to get the word out to people who may not know what is happening in their state. Um, we were talking earlier offline about Colorado's ballot and how many questions there are on there. And, you know, you think you're going into the ballot box to check your your vote for president and um, your local uh, and state officials, but then you have an entire list of ballot questions that, that are very confusing. So um, I'm not sure what people will do if they don't have information. I think a lot of people will just not answer the questions or they will just be duped into, yeah, this sounds good, I'll, I'll support it, and then find out later uh, when it's too late what effect this is going to have on their pocketbook. Well, and you don't know what you don't know, right? Lee and Tommy, you are both experts in this space, and even you are calling the bureaucrats in charge of some of these uh, some of these uh, questions, and they're not giving you a straight answer. So you can imagine how the typical taxpayer who's busy running their business, running their household, not paying attention to what the bureaucrats in their municipality are doing, are not going to know that a half a penny increase uh, on a utility or you know whatever the the question is in front of them, what that actually means for them and what that means for their local economies. Tommy, you mentioned to me a couple of taxes that I think would make that case particularly clear: uh, income tax raises in Arizona being one of them. I I think we saw a payroll tax in Colorado. What else are you watching as an expert in this space that you think would have a huge economic impact that voters might not be able to realize just on their face when they're looking at the ballot? Yeah, sure. I mean, Arizona, there's a potential doubling, uh, near doubling of the state income tax there would be about uh, $827 million a year tax increase. Um, not only does it take more money out of the pockets of taxpayers, but for residents who want to leave high income Places like Cal high tax states like California or Illinois, you know, we'll see that. Uh, it might make it less attractive for them to settle there. They could just settle right across the border in Las Vegas where they don't have a state income tax. Uh, Colorado, there's going to be a payroll tax of 1.2% on wages split evenly between employers and employees. That is a potential billion dollar tax increase every year. Um, you know, Colorado has a strong taxpayer bill of rights and actually takes care of its taxpayers as a good, strong uh, tax structure, but higher taxes is, is not going to be encouraging for businesses or for people to set up shop there or to relocate there. Well, it's striking to me that we're talking about income taxes in places like Arizona and Illinois, where during the last recession, we actually saw significant income tax hikes. Uh, Illinois in particular, uh, our colleague Joe Bench Bishop Henchman reminded me, was a temporary tax increase, increase, which of course we know is not really a thing that exists. Uh, some of it was phased out, but some of it remains. Uh, and in Arizona as well, it seems that the lesson hasn't been learned there that raising taxes in a recession, even though politicians may have suffered for that decision, uh, economically taxpayers still bear the brunt of the consequences of those bad public policy decisions. Uh, before we sign off for the day, I wanna give both of you an opportunity to discuss anything that we haven't covered today. We of course covered the states that are bad examples. Next week, we'll be looking at some of the regulatory initiatives that are on the ballot in state, so please join us for that continued conversation. But Lee, I'm going to go to you first. You know, what else are you watching as someone who has an eye on all 50 states? Alaska, of course, being a really striking example of uh, maybe a tax we wouldn't expect uh, during these very difficult economic times. You've got politicians pushing an economically uh, harmful tax increase through. Is there another state or another initiative that you're watching that you think could really have an impact uh, if it gets on, if it gets passed into law in November? Well, Florida and their minimum wage, uh, $15 minimum wage increase, that could be uh, uh, something to keep our eye on. We have talked with folks in the state, in the restaurant industry, and many uh, weren't even aware of it. And, uh, you know, tourism is so important to that state. And restaurants have been so affected by the pandemic. Um, that will be very concerning if that goes through. Um, but we've talked a lot about negative things. Let me just throw one positive in there. The state of Georgia has a, a, a wonderful amendment. It is so refreshing 
um, I can't even uh, tell you how excited I am. It's called the Georgia Dedicated Tax and Fee Revenue Amendment, which basically says that you pretty much have to know, uh, put that money aside for the intended purposes because unfortunately, and having been a state senator in the state of Wisconsin, we've seen where um, governors and elected officials will raid funds and use them for other purposes. And this will make sure that that doesn't happen. So kudos to the folks in Georgia. Uh, it looks like that is going to pass through. Well, that certainly is exciting. Tommy, I know you've got the ballot guide tattooed on the inside of your eyeballs by this point. Uh, any other states or initiatives that you would like to mention as we talk about the tax implications across the country that are on the ballot this November? Yeah, sure. So in our research, we found there's about $50 billion worth of bonds that are going to be on the ballot um, across 25 states and hundreds of counties. So basically, that means counties issue um, uh, bonds and they get a, a payment. Uh, lump sum payment, and then they use those funds to fund things like school construction, highways, roads. So $50 billion is a lot. And a lot of the time they don't say about how much they're gonna be raising property tax rates in order to meet those bonded payments. So taxpayers, again, will be kept in the dark for how much they're gonna be spending on, on, their, on, on their monthly mortgage and their um, uh, monthly property taxes. That's a good that's a good point how most municipal taxpayers probably don't understand that cities have to collateralize their bonds in some way and that comes in the form of new taxes on taxpayers. Well, Tommy Leah, thank you so much for this enlightening discussion today. We covered those three top ones but also got a big discussion in all those other little tiny but in the, in the long run of things really big tax increases. Hopefully taxpayers are watching uh, to all of our viewers keep your eye out for that ballot and guide that will come out next week and next week on on Friday, we'll be talking about some of the regulatory initiatives that taxpayers will be win weighing in on on their ballots that coming week uh, with the election closing in, the, closing in in the next couple of weeks. We want to make sure we're getting that information out there so taxpayers can make an educated decision when they go to the polls in a few weeks. Thank you for joining us this Friday. We'll see you next Friday. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.